I'm going to talk about the energy of land use and specifically how we as people, as the public, perceive it, its benefits and also its problems. The global economies, they're driven by the extraction and processing of natural resources. And specific, specifically here I'm talking about food, wood fiber, energy, and the mineral sector. Collectively, these industries create immense benefits to citizens. They give us our jobs, our royalties, our GDP. But these land uses also create immense problems to the environment. And whereas we, I think, well understand the benefits, we talk about them every day, you know, our jobs and the GDP we get, the liabilities, the problems are either ignored or they're not properly appreciated. So this talk is about kind of getting a glimpse into the why that we understand the good stuff and we seem to ignore the bad stuff. This story could be told in different global geographies, but here's a TED talk in Alberta. Let's focus on Alberta. 68 million hectares, 3.8 million people, a superheated economy, and in recent decades in particular, we've received the, in, the attention of the global audience for praise and condemnation at the pace at which we're producing hydrocarbons and greenhouse gases. So you don't have to look much beyond this particular graph. This is the amount of money that has come into Alberta for what we call risk capital or our investment dollars. From 1998 to 2008, it grew from 50 billion to 250 billion, a quarter trillion dollars. So that is a superheated economy. We're growing quickly. And not all, but the majority of this money is going to the hydrocarbon sector. So that tells us how important the energy sector is to the province of Alberta. But before the preeminence of the energy sector came to Alberta, an equally interesting and diverse history. So let's look at that a bit. Since the glacial ice sheets retreated off of Alberta about 8,000 years ago, the land use has been that of First Nations, Aboriginal people moving through the landscape, drawing resources, conducting their life history. They were the land use. 250 years ago, Europeans arrived, and the first European land use was one of essentially extirpation of bison, which helped secure the land base from the Aboriginal people, but also produced an amazing volume of bone and skulls to ship yeast for fertilizer. Well, that land use came to a crash with the end of the bison. And about the same time, started another land use, and that was our fur history, our fur shopping industry, and it exploded and participated widely by First Nations and non-Aboriginal people too. The backbone of that industry was the beaver. And as we trapped that species to extinction in Alberta, yes, subsequently it's been reintroduced, that land use also collapsed. Well, the human population in Alberta is beginning to grow, and it needs wood for houses, so we have a timbering industry. It needs fuel to heat those houses and to cook, and we have our first hydrocarbon sector, and that's coal mining. In the late 1800s, the agriculture sector takes hold and starts to expand, both with livestock and crops. But in 1947, in blows Leduc number one and ushers in a brand new era an era that would drive the Alberta economy for five decades, taking us to where we are here today. A hydrocarbon sector that is, in all likelihood, going to continue to drive the economy for many decades into the future. As these uses grew, they needed people, they needed workforce. So the human population in Alberta expanded at about 2% per year. When Alberta became a province, what, 1905, maybe a couple hundred thousand people. Today, 3.8 million. And we begin to see for the first time how these small exponents were only growing at 2% a year, taking us to the 3.8 million people. Well, these people need resources. They need food. So the croplands, again, starting in the late 1800s, and here we begin to see how they expand through Alberta's native prairies, pushing west into the foothills, north into the parklands, consuming the southern part of the boreal forest in the East River, producing a phenomenal amount of product, of food, not so much for Alberta's consumption, primarily for export. And then, in the late 1940s, starts the energy sector, as we see how it grows. And here we're looking at the footprint of all the conventional oil and gas and natural and unconventional oil and gas, coal bed, methane, coal, and bitumen. And by these footprints, I mean the seismic lines and well pads and access roads, pipelines, processing plants, a tremendous footprint. Here's Alberta basically today, and producing a phenomenal amount of hydrocarbons. 
if you look at the total amount of commodities that are being produced in Alberta by all of these industries, and I'm not going to read the numbers, but they're the average annual over the last several years, you'd be hard-pressed to find any other geography in North America of similar scale to Alberta that's producing these kind of commodities in terms of livestock, in terms of hardwood and softwood, in terms of the energy sector, and in terms of electricity. This is truly a superheated economy. And it's the basis for our quality of life in many ways. It gives us our jobs, it gives us our GDP, it gives us our infrastructure. But you can't produce these kind of commodities on a place like Alberta, 68 million hectares, without getting really serious about how you want to transform the landscape. So what have we done for a very young province that's basically a little bit more than 100 years old? We've taken 11 million hectares and put it into cultivated land. On 14 million hectares, we graze our livestock. Over 24 million hectares is directed to the forestry sector. And 40,000 hectares, and the footprint today of our cities and towns is about a quarter million hectares. There's over 400,000 hectares in the footprint of transportation, and if you add all the footprint of the energy sector up, it's over 1 million hectares. So why all these numbers? Well, if Alberta's 68 million hectares, today, over three quarters of the province of Alberta is in the direct footprint of land use, or will be, based on a allocation, is primarily the forestry sector. So over three quarters, so it only took about one century to take this province of ours that was considered so big and relatively empty and so pristine with a bank account full of natural capital, I mean clean air and water and ecosystems, and now it's become a very busy industrial landscape. And this has created phenomenal benefits to Alberta. But it's also created some challenges. So we don't have much time, but let's focus on a few. Water quality, so foundationally important. And here we see how it's changing declining. Water quality is declining because the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment that's rolling off these industrial landscapes and particularly agriculture is changing it. It took us two generations to take Alberta's surface water that was fully potable. We could all drink it without chemical or physical treatment. It took two generations to take Alberta's water, probably our most precious natural commodity, such that we won't drink it without physical or chemical treatment. I think that's something that we should be very sobered by. <coughs> Alberta's soils. Nothing could be more foundational than soil except for possibly water. Let's look at these soils. These are the black loams, the best of Alberta's soils, and you can see them in the Edmonton Calgary Corridor. Remember where they are. Let's dissolve them off. Let's look at the history of the non-agricultural footprint. These are the expanding cities, expanding transportation, and the footprint of the hydrocarbon sector. And you can see how it's grown into the Edmonton Calgary Corridor. So as we have policies that grow land use forward and create all these benefits, unknowingly, we are actively paving over our best soils. And in fact, if the human population continues to grow at the rate it is, and we continue to pave over these soils, by 2060, Alberta, for the first time in its history, is likely to become an importer for food. The question is, why aren't we detecting these losses in ecological goods and services? Why aren't we connecting the dots? Why aren't we seeing these things in a fashion that allows us to trigger a conversation that inspires the way we think as individuals, as families, or as communities? You know, it's not the first time these stories have been told. You, know, you think of people like David Suzuki, or E.O. Wilson, or Rachel Carson. They've all brought compelling scientific material to this particular conversation. It's been well told. What this tells me is that the science is not what is holding us back. What's holding us back is the way in which we tell the stories that inspire people to understand and inspire people to act. And that's where we need to change. And I think the biggest problem is because of this me, here, now mentality that most Albertans have as we consider our actions. And I'd like to discuss that a little bit. Me, the most commonly spoken word in the English language. It's about me. It certainly isn't about you. It's just so important. Every waking hour, whether it be the media, advertising, schools, or work, even at home, we're reminded that me, I, is the most important at the expense of the, at the, expense of the bigger community. Here, 
So here's one individual living in a house. Most of us don't even know how much wood is required to build that house or how much fuel is required to heat or cool it or the amount of waste we produce. But that's only one individual of 3.8 million. So let's take this TED event. It's about eight hours long. And how much is going on in eight hours in the province of Alberta during this TED event? Over 10 hectares of agricultural land or native habitat will be lost to urban sprawl. We will log about 72 hectares of forest. Alberta will increase its human population by 87 people through immigration and childbirth. We'll produce about 4,000 metric ton of waste. Over an eight hour period, we'll drive over 39 million kilometers of personal vehicles. And we'll drill 14 new oil or gas wells. So that's an, an example of wrapping up meaningful space and time to show the effects. So let's look at time. See this blue individual? That's where you sit right now. That's a satellite image of where you are. But you can't see Calgary. And the reason you can't is it's 1951. This building, this campus didn't even exist. We were on the outskirts of Calgary. Calgary continues to grow at about 2% per year, per year, going up to the 600 square kilometers that we have today, reminding us what happens when 2% continues to grow through time. And if this pattern continues, if we sprawl into the future the way we have in the past, and we remind ourselves that Calgary, in many ways, is the poster child of sprawl in Canada, Calgary becomes 3,000 square kilometers. Now, many people in this room might be skeptical. How could that actually happen? But I'd say that'd be the same skepticism as our great-grandparents would have had if we would have told them Calgary 600 square kilometers in 2010. So how do we reference time? We don't do a good job of detecting these gradual changes of 2% per year. Here's another way to kind of tell the story. Here's a young man born in 1958, six years old. 25 years later, he's a middle-aged kind of man. 25 years after that, it's what his kids call the old guy. <laughs> now the first observation here is what doctors tell is true. Noses really do continue to grow throughout your entire life. <laughs> but I see big differences. A couple years ago, I was at a conference in Manitoba, and this guy I hadn't seen since I was that age recognized me, and he came up in what was a, a very brief episode of honesty and maybe lack of diplomacy, he said, what the hell's happened? You look really old. <laughs> and he was contrasting me from that picture to that picture. And I thought, yeah, you know, I'm 25 years older. I, I'm supposed to look old. Well, back in this picture, that's when I met my wife. And she spent pretty well every day with me since then. And somehow she hasn't detected the same level of facial decomposition. <laughs> because she sees it every single day and doesn't detect the bigger picture. So that tells us something. And this is the same with water quality. We're losing water quality in Alberta at 2% a year, but we don't detect it. But if someone were to come back to Alberta today and hadn't been here for 25 years, I think they'd have something to tell us about water quality. So we're really good at the me, here, now thing. That's how we evaluate land use. And heck, we're wired that way. Our evolutionary history has selected traits, so it's, we're always looking for the next meal. Well, times have changed. We've got a population of, what, 7 billion. We have a global economy. We can push goods and services around this globe faster than you can blink an eye. And now we have people with the me here now looking around going, okay, what additional forests might I log? What additional soils could support crops? What additional hydrocarbon types will new technologies allow me to pull out of the ground? How much more water could I extract from rivers for agriculture? What areas could sprawl for cities? And a me here now approach allows me instant gratification. I get the benefits of these land uses. But what are the costs? How are we transferring equity in terms of natural capital to our kids and our grandkids? We need to rewire the way we think. We need to realize that me here now is okay, because that's how we are genetically programmed, but we need to also realize that in addition to me is a community, in addition to here is a region, 
in addition to now is intergenerational. And somehow we need to struggle through with the conversations of understanding not only the benefits to me, but the benefits of land use through space and time. We're not really wired that way. We need to lift our head up and move from this ad hoc approach. We need to have a conversation of what should Alberta look like in 20 years, in 40 years, heck, in 200 years. How much of this province is going to be in agriculture, forestry, energy, transportation, residential? What kind of water quality do you guys want? How much carbon do you want in the soil? How much biodiversity does Alberta need? How breathable is the air? These are not anti-business types of conversations. It's merely taking natural capital and putting it on the table and saying it deserves to be discussed and we need to evaluate as we explore different options. Imagine for a moment that you're all the premier of Alberta. There is a teeter-totter. On the left is the me here now thinking. On the right is the community, regional, intergenerational thought processes. What sort of land use decisions would you make today about Alberta in terms of maintaining our quality of life? And how would you consider the effects of it in terms of the quality of this landscape that we bequeath to our kids and our grandkids? That's an important conversation, and I fear we don't have it enough. I don't think this is a trivial issue. Many people, in fact, would describe it as a collapse challenge. We need to have the, the bravery, the wisdom, the commitment to have this conversation. We need to be talking about, again, how land uses create benefits for us, but how much do we want to leave behind? These are going to be very, very difficult conversations. I'd like to leave you with a challenge. 1% of your day is 14 minutes. In every decision we make on a daily basis about our services, what we want, how we do it, I can guarantee you it relates to land use. I think we need to think about it not only from the perspective of me here now, but again, communities, regional, and intergenerational. Let me give you some examples. How do we move around this landscape? Are we walking? Are we driving? Public transportation, we're on a bike. Different implications, me, near, me here now, community, generational, okay? Where do we get our food from? Is it local? What kind of food is it? How often do we take vacations? Where do we go? Are we contemplating buying that second vacation home? How much are we prepared to pay for water? How much are we prepared to pay for carbon or wood fiber? All of these things affect how we enjoy life today, but in a very meaningful way, they influence our kids' lives in these regional landscapes. And as you begin to think about it this way, I think you'll be, uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised that you're not alone, that every week there's more people thinking this way in Calgary and other cities in Alberta, Canada, and globally. This is a very important conversation. And as you get comfortable with this conversation, I would ask you to invite others into it. Thank you very much.